child sexual abuse is often viewed inaccurately as unpreventable. There is, as you well know, Jeremy, this idea that people that engage in these behaviors are monsters. And the unfortunate, um, the unfortunate thing about that monster metaphor is that it really puts blinders on us. Hello and welcome to another episode of Prostasia Foundation's podcast vodcast series, Sex, Human Rights and CSA Prevention. This month we're joined by Dr. Elizabeth Letourneau, who is the director of the Moore Centre for the Prevention of Child Sexual Abuse at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Welcome, Dr. Letourneau, and uh, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure, Jeremy. So I wonder if you would tell us a little about your work at the Moore Centre for the Prevention of Child Sexual Abuse. I, I'm happy to do that. Um, I trained as a clinical psychologist many years ago, but I've always focused on research uh, in my career. In 2011, uh, John Hopkins brought me to the School of Public Health. Uh, I'm a professor in the Department of Mental Health at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. And a year later, with support from Steve and Julia Moore, uh, benefactors to the center, we launched the Moore Center for the Prevention of Child Sexual Abuse. The focus of our center is to develop, rigorously evaluate, and then broadly disseminate effective child sexual abuse prevention programming. And we have a strong focus on um, perpetration prevention, also taking more of a whole health approach to addressing the needs of people who might be at risk to um, abuse children, sexually abuse children, uh, but who are committed to not doing so and who deserve, as we all do, uh, a healthy, happy life and the supports they need to achieve that. So what are some of the programs that the centre um, has to towards this aim? Well, you know, when we bring a public health approach to any public health problem, including child sexual abuse, uh, we look at what are the risk and protective factors. So risk factors increase the likelihood of um, child sexual abuse and protective factors would reduce that likelihood or protect against it. One risk factor is age. So children actually um, cause half or perhaps even more of uh, child sexual abuse uh, cases. This is because children, as they're becoming sexual, really don't know the rules. Uh, we've done research and we know that, that a, a big reason that children might engage younger children, for example, in inappropriate, harmful, or illegal sexual behaviors because they really don't know that they're not supposed to. Um, other risk factors based on age include things like impulsivity, inadequate adult supervision, the influence of other peers. And so one of our prevention program focuses on middle school age children who are, you know, just at the point of puberty and, and beginning to, to engage in their initial sexual behaviors. And we call this responsible behavior with younger children. So the program is framed as this is responsible behavior. Um, and, and we state very clearly that engaging younger children is in sexual behavior is not okay. is not responsible behavior. And here's why. And we do a lot of, um, really great kind of activities and it's a classroom based uh, intervention. We, we did a small, what we would call a pilot randomized control trial, small trial in Baltimore City with four middle schools that were involved, including a school that my own children go to that I, that I love. Um, and we got some positive and encouraging results. So we hope to continue, um, we hope to continue evaluating that intervention to see if that is an effective way to reduce the likelihood that older children, you know, children on the cusp of puberty would engage younger children inappropriately. So responsible behavior with younger children is one of our prevention programs. Another is called Help Wanted. And Help Wanted has a different focus. Um, Help Wanted is an intervention that we designed to try to meet the needs of people with sexual interest in children, uh, particularly younger people, adolescents and young adults, although there's no age limits on accessing the intervention and, and we think there's no age limits on perhaps benefiting from the intervention. When we designed Help Wanted, we reached out to people with sexual interest in children living in their communities and asked them, what would have helped them when they were younger? What would have helped them? Um, and so we, we talked to about 29 different people and we took, we recorded those interviews and we pulled from those interviews um, some of the elements that we thought needed to be in our intervention. 
um, and then coupled with our own expertise of you know being in the field for decades and and we ended up with an initial five sessions that are focused on uh, what is child sexual abuse and why is it harmful? Um, you know, particularly important for adolescents and young adults to understand that even a child who doesn't appear to be being harmed by uh, uh, sexual abuse um, often does face pretty significant harms. And so uh, we would never um, want to suggest that a child could consent to sex with an adult or with a, an older adolescent, um, even if it appears that the behavior is engaged in willingly. So there were a lot of reasons why we wanted to include one whole session just on what is child sexual abuse, why is it harmful, and what ways is it harmful. But then also looking at um, how how can you achieve sexual satisfaction if uh, one of your uh, sexual interests is off limits, as children are, and as um, sexually abusive images of children are as well. Uh, so we've got a session that is around that, sessions around how to, how to um, uh, achieve and or maintain uh, mental and physical health. So we know people who, who have um, what for many is, is going to be a chronic lifelong um, issue that, that it carries a lot of stigma with it um, and can carry some, some real challenges uh, that we want to encourage good mental health practices whether that's mindfulness or meditation, um, staying on top of any anxiety or depression issues. Um, we know that suicidality is common among people who identify as sexually attracted to children and, and we don't have a separate session on suicidality. We, we, we would like to develop that, but we do address, you know, we certainly have resources for people who are experiencing um, suicidal thoughts. Um, as well as depression and anxiety and other issues. Physical health we know is very important. Um, we have a session that where we uh, present, have people weigh the pros and cons of whether to disclose their interest to friends or family or professionals. Um, certainly in the United States and in some other countries, there can be real risks that uh, accompany disclosure. Uh, even for people who have never acted on a sexual interest in children, they may be held accountable as if they had or as if they were about to. Um, so if you are an adolescent living with younger kids, you could be reported to Child Protective Services who may decide to take you out of the home mm. because they believe you, know, you are now a risk to your siblings or to who, whatever, whoever the younger children are in the household. Um, so there are real cons. There are also real pros to disclosing you know, a big part of your, your life uh, to the people that care about you and wanting to live an authentic um, a life where people who you love and who you know a lot about also know a lot about you and to having people who can help you because there are, can be very difficult. There can be moments where it is hard to not act on strong sexual urges and to be able to have somebody to call and say, hey, I need some help today. Um, so we, we have them go through this whole process of weighing pros and cons and just have some good information in there about also if you are going to disclose how do you set up a difficult conversation? And this applies to any difficult conversation, but how do you set up a difficult conversation to be as successful as possible? Mm -hmm. And we give some strategies for that so that you're not blindsiding somebody who probably is not expecting to get this particular piece of information from you mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and how to help set both you and the person you're gonna disclose to set, set that up for success. Um, so there's, there's a number of different uh, sessions. There's five, um, discrete sessions or tabs on our online intervention, help on an intervention. There's a whole page of resources. Um, that's up now as of May 8th of this year. It's it's up, it's freely available to anyone who wants to access it. Um, I haven't looked at the web analytics recently, but we did have thousands of people access it within the first three weeks that it was made available and we were really gratified. It's advertised on Google and on Facebook, uh, which we are also really, really thrilled to have those kinds of partnerships and then through many other organizations like Stop It Now and colleagues in this space where we, we um, try to promote each other's work so that people who are looking for help can find it. So I understand that was brought forward, wasn't it, because of the COVID crisis, is that true? It, that's true. In in the public health field, we, there is the strong, um, almost really a requirement to evaluate an intervention before you make it available. We're all aware of interventions that people thought worked and that don't. Uh, once once you kind of put them under the the bright shining light of of scientific uh, empirical scrutiny. 
And so I was, we had finished the first, these first five sessions. So we had a nice solid intervention to move forward on, but I had not released it. My colleagues and I who co-developed it, I should say, um, Dr. Ryan Shields, who's at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, Lowell and Ms. Amanda Ruzicka, who's uh, one of my colleagues at the Moore Center. Uh, we developed this in collaboration with other other friends and colleagues, Daniel Webster and uh, Dr. Daniel Webster and Dr. Jill Levinson in particular supported this effort, as, as did many others. But we had not released it because we hadn't been able to evaluate it yet. And, um, you know, finding funding to evaluate uh, uh, prevention interventions, particularly prevention interventions that are geared for people with sexual interest in children, a highly stigmatized group, um, finding that kind of funding had proved quite elusive. And so we, we were contacted by a foundation that does do this kind of work, does fund this kind of research. The Oak Foundation, who knew about Help Wanted and asked if, if uh, encouraged us to go ahead and launch it, gave us some funding to make that possible. And this was because in the time of uh, the COVID crisis, the responses to the pandemic include, as everyone knows, um, more people spending more time online for work, for recreation, and for education, um, which is a risk factor for for beginning to delve into um, uh, child sexual exploitation and abusive materials. Mm. We knew from some of our partners, they were seeing increased traffic on their websites of, among people looking for help, people with concerns about their own thoughts and behaviors looking for help. And we, um, you know, we also knew that there were a lot of children at home online uh, with, um, uh, for, for their own schooling and their own educational uh, needs. And so this, the, the other risk factor for people, whether or not they have sexual interest in children, but one, one risk factor for a person engaging in harmful sexual behavior with a child is not having a job. And, you know, millions of people are either unemployed or underemployed right now because of the pandemic. And so that was another really big mm. um, risk factor that, that our colleagues in Germany, Dr. Klaus Beer and others have, have highlighted in their work. And so we, there was a lot uh, going into the mix, uh, and we decided at the end of the day that this was an intervention, you know, we believe in, we can't say it works because we haven't evaluated it, but we did put it out there. And as I said, it's been up since early May. So it's really interesting that you've, you've already mentioned two separate programs or interventions towards different populations that are at risk in different ways. You have um, uh, young adolescents who are at risk of abusing smaller children because they just don't know. And then you've got people who have a sexual attraction towards children. Are there any other distinct populations that are at risk and that could be targeted with prevention interventions, whether or not the Moore Centre is currently doing so? Yes, we certainly know that there are people who who are not at risk due to age or uh, sexual interest because many people who offend are adults who are not primarily sexually interested in children. Figuring out who among, you know, what are the risk factors among that group is a is still a little bit of an understudied area. We know of characteristics like psychopathy, like just not caring about the needs or wants of other people is a risk factor for engaging in harmful behavior in general, exploitative behavior in general. Among um, people who already have a, uh, a conviction for sexual offending, psychopathy increases the risk for recidivism. We don't have a good sense of how much psychopathy might increase the risk for an initial offense, right? So that's, that's sort of not very clear. Um, you know, a lot of um, offending against children, sexual offending against children, can happen in the context of youth serving organizations. This, you know, broadly that includes almost any organization, schools, uh, you know, summer camps, uh, scouting, coaching, religious uh, organizations, anything that involves a lot of children. And, you know, we, we strongly suspect that uh, there, there are people who drift into, adults who drift into offending against children without having a clear or strong motivation to do so, possibly because they are surrounded by kids all the time, unaware that they may even experience any sexual interest in a child, and then when they do, maybe do not know how to handle that. Uh, possib My guess is that for most people, those experiences are very transient. They go on about their day, nothing happens. <clears throat> but perhaps uh, if there is the confluence of external exacerbating factors, like maybe 
maybe your own personal life is is not going well right now. Maybe you have financial difficulties. Maybe you've got mental health or substance abuse issues. Um, that some combination, maybe you're particularly immature, some combination of factors coupled with um, being working or volunteering in a setting where you're surrounded by children may make people, some people at some points in their in their uh, work vulnerable to acting on these these attractions we that is not a well studied uh, uh process at all and it's really interesting that despite the intense interest in in curbing child sexual abuse that our, our community has there is uh, there are understudied areas like this and that it is difficult to get funding for interventions like yours why is that and, and what can we do to to change that yeah, I appreciate you you starting out by by acknowledging the intense interest. I think everybody takes this very seriously. This is, uh, you know, child sexual abuse and child abuse and neglect on a broader scale are are can be quite devastating to to the children that experience those and to the children that engage in those behaviors um, and are identified as as you know offenders and as well as to adults who engage in those behaviors. So the harm is very very real. We do as a nation. Uh, take this very seriously, but we put most of our intervention and most of our resources into after the fact strategies. So it, particularly robustly, we uh, try to um, identify, uh, uh, convict and, and punish offenders. And certainly we do wanna hold adults accountable, appropriately accountable for harmful behavior against children. But I'll just say that national data, publicly available data, indicates that we spend as a nation about $6 billion each year to incarcerate sex offenders in federal and in state prisons. So $6 billion a year. By contrast, we currently, our federal budget currently has $1 million, $1 million allocated towards child sexual abuse prevention research. So, wow. and that money has only been around this year. Wow. Before 2020, we did not have any money that was designated in the federal budget that I was ever able to find, certainly, that that was specific to child sexual abuse prevention because I think child sexual abuse is often viewed inaccurately as unpreventable. Yeah. There is, as you well know, Jeremy, this idea that people that engage in these behaviors are monsters. And the unfortunate um, the unfortunate thing about that monster metaphor is that it really puts blinders on us. Mm. Um, first of all, it means we don't, you know, you can't predict or prevent what a monster is going to do. Yeah. So the only thing you can do is just clean up the mess after it happens, which is a terrible way to, to only focus on child sexual abuse. It's absolutely important. Again, I want to be super clear to hold adults appropriately accountable for their behaviors. But we can't only do that and ever get ahead of this problem. Um, recidivism, reoffending, accounts for very little of uh, annual new uh, victimizations. We've got to focus more on primary prevention, but we view it as unpreventable, we being the public and, and policymakers who represent the public. The other thing with the monster metaphor that is so damaging is it blinds us to the people in our lives who we know and love and care about who might be engaging in inappropriate or harmful behavior. And so that blinds us to doing anything about that until... Uh, until it's too late. And we see example after example, Larry Nasser and Jerry Sandusky and, and other people that offended with impunity for decades, uh, where people knew what was going on, but I think many of them just didn't believe that someone they cared about or liked or respected would actually do that. Um, so, you know, part of our um, mission as a center is to really shift the paradigm past this idea that um, anyone who engages in these behaviors are monsters to, to, a, to, to a much more nuanced understanding that, you know, this is, this is a preventable public health problem and that there are people who are at risk who don't ever want to engage in these behaviors. There are people at risk who don't know that they might engage in these behaviors, either because they're young or because they're just unaware for other reasons. And to really try to, to, to uh, prevent children from being harmed in the first place, which we think is equally important to addressing the needs of survivors, very, very important, and to holding adults accountable and to getting children who have made mistakes back on the right track and children who have engaged in harmful behaviors back on the right track. Um, but primary prevention, really moving in before harm has occurred, 
deserves a bigger platform and definitely deserves more resources. We're continuing to try to increase the, the amount to support the increase of uh, to support increases to that amount in the federal budget. That funding goes to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And right now, the House Labor HHS Committee, which uh, controls a lot of funding, they have doubled that amount to two million dollars. We hope the Senate will follow. Um, the the Senate hasn't released a budget yet, but we we hope to see an actual increase um, in that funding. Ultimately, we'd like to get it up to at least ten million dollars. Ten million dollars to address something that affects maybe twenty percent of girls and five to ten percent of all boys in the U.S. and worldwide. It affects twelve percent of all children. We think twenty million dollars is pretty reasonable. And yeah. again, in comparison to the to the robust resources that go to the after the fact interventions. It's a drop in the bucket, isn't it? So uh, uh, I, I everything you've said makes total sense to me. And yet um, I've c- constantly come across people who think that these prevention based interventions amount to to being soft against offenders or or, or potential uh, perpetrators who are, you know, regarded as just as bad. You know, a lot of people feel like even if you have the potential, you know, or the thought uh, of viewing a child sexually, then you're as bad as someone who perpetrates. Um, how, how, I don't know how we can really address this, but how can we counter the perception that preventing abuse is being weak against perpetrators or that it shows more concern for them than for victims? Well, I think this podcast is a really good example of how we can do that. When people listen to discussions that are objective, uh, fact-based about child abuse and neglect and, and about child sexual abuse in particular, that removes a little bit of the emotional, the emotionality I'm not sure that's a word, <laughs> um, but this, you know, this is a this is a highly emotional topic. Um, in my experience, I have not encountered lots of people who believe that the work that I do or the work that we do at the Moore Center um, somehow aids or abets offending against children. You may you may know that I gave a TED Med talk back in 2016, and that. That talk generated a lot of people reaching out to me, and the dominant response uh, to that talk that I got was, huh, I had not thought about prevention. I hadn't really thought about this in that way. Um, And I think the more that we, we promote this idea that indeed, like any public health problem, this is a preventable public health problem and needs to be addressed um, with that that three-legged stool of prevention, intervention with with people who have caused harm and and, and support and treatment of people who have suffered harm, um, that that that's the best way to approach this. And the the analogy that I use is with child physical abuse. We it's a crime. You can go to you certainly can go to prison um, and to jail for for child physical abuse. But we also for 30 years have worked very very hard to develop evaluate and disseminate effective child physical abuse and child neglect prevention programming. And so we have nurse home visiting programs, nurse family partnership programs that are all across the United States, highly effective at reducing child physical abuse, at preventing child physical abuse, particularly among parents who are at higher risk, young parents, first time parents, parents facing other obstacles. But indeed, it's so effective that there are some places, I believe the military implements these interventions with all new parents, uh, which is fantastic. So I think we need to get, uh, you know, more towards that kind of a model, you know, this public health approach to addressing child sexual abuse. It is not just a criminal health problem. It's not just a social or behavioral problem. It's a public health problem. And there's, there's, there's tools for addressing it as such. Mm. So that may, you may have already answered this question, but if there's one thing about your work that you wish was more widely understood, what would it be? It would be that we absolutely can prevent child sexual abuse from happening in the first place, both the victimization, but also importantly, the perpetration, that there are people at risk who want help, who avail themselves of help when it is available, um, there are people who don't know they're at risk that we, we 
desperately need to figure out ways to reach out to, you know, how do we identify people who might be at risk, who don't even know they are because they, they don't have some obvious um, characteristic like a young age, you know, being pubertal or, or, or right, at, right at the cusp of puberty, um, who, who don't have strong sexual interest in children, but who nevertheless are at risk of engaging in these behaviors. So there is, it is fundamentally possible to prevent child sexual abuse and and it requires resources. It requires some public will, and it, it absolutely requires resources. It can't be done um, without resources. And, and, and frankly, it can't be done with $1 million either. I mean, that's, that's a great start, and we, uh, we so appreciate um, the, the Congress uh, for enacting that, that line item in its 2020 um, budget. We need to see that number grow. I mean, it seems like in the year of our Lord 2020, we're only just beginning to focus on this problem in the way that we need to. Uh, it feels, it, certainly from a financial, I, I would say, you know, interest in this, there's, there's never been a time where there hasn't been concern about children. Uh, there, there has just never been a time. Um, there's also never been a time where we really took a strong prevention focus, and, and that time is long overdue. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm really glad that you're, you're here fighting this fight for us, and uh, hopefully there'll be many more people like you in years to come. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Letourneau, for, for this really inspiring conversation. It's been absolutely my pleasure. pleasure. Thank you, Jeremy. And thank you for watching this episode. Tune in again next month for another conversation about sex, human rights, and CSA prevention. If you're watching on YouTube, you can click here to subscribe to our channel, and you can also donate to support our work. Thanks again for watching, and see you next month.